and also working less will mean less fuel consumption, less less actually having to you know get to work either whether it's with cars or with public transport or whatever, um, and less use of fuel and that sort of thing. So that's that's my little potted thing about why we, you know why we they've, probably other people have better arguments for this. So I'd like to hear it. Because I didn't, I got into this through through feminism. I didn't really get into this through, through the green movement. It has to be said. Okay. And right, why is the right into it? Um, oh yes, and the other, sorry, the other green argument. It's sorry, it's not so much about reducing consumption, but it's also I think basic income in its full form will give people the option to not do work which is harmful to themselves or the environment. So I think that's quite a key thing if we really want to reduce our footprint on the land that we'd be able to refuse jobs like you know working in the fracking industry or working in the arms industry or working in the sorts of you know the sorts of industries which unfortunately there's some people on the left say, well we need them because jobs. And I think we need we need something that's alternative to jobs. You know, it's an argument for why, you know, why we, we don't want to do these things. Um, right. And then the other question is, why is the right into it? Um, well, they, you know, I don't know. Hold on. Maybe you should talk about what we mean by the right. It might be the people around this table. Well, the right. Where? Yeah. No, I, that's a very good question, actually. Um, what do we mean about the right? Well, in this country, the people that are supporting a form of basic income are is the yeah, come on in. Uh, the people supporting the, the think tank which supports basic income is the Adam Smith Institute. And they like to, they actually for, uh, support the not so much what we define as basic income, which is just an unconditional payment. They, they support something called the negative income tax, which actually would be, it's a bit like tax credit. So you would have, you know, basically there would be an adjustment every year <coughs> how much you, you earn that year. And um, while, you know, yes, the, the idea with basic income is that, you, you know, if it's based on, on income tax, then obviously you'd be taxing any income that you would have above, sorry, above the basic income, you wouldn't actually lose, you wouldn't actually lose your basic income, you know, through, if you, if you earn too much, so. And their main argument is, is an anti-bureaucratic one. So try to, trying to get rid of the bureaucracy of, of the benefit system. Unfortunately, also in the U.S. in particular, Charles Murray and people like that are, are wanting to get rid of all state services, um, which is a bit scary. Uh, and it's certainly not, that's, but that's not the majority view of the basic income movement as, as it is. Um, we said, you know, just about, I mean, all of, the, all of the groups that are for basic income internationally are talking about it in terms of people not, you know, it leaving everybody better off. Or not not everybody, but the poor is better off, and you know maybe taking something from the rich, but not you know certainly not sort of poor to middle income that, that people would be less less, uh, less well off. And also you know in terms of certain universal services like healthcare and education, I mean it would be actually good to expand those uh, to housing, for example, or telecoms, or the you know the sorts of things that we actually need to 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 live, and then you could have a smaller basic income. You know, if you had certain other, other sorts of things that were that were universally available, um, the right is into it. Yeah, it's the lack of bureaucracy thing. Um, some of them, some people, who are probably a bit nicer, I suppose, uh, are really sort of thinking about it in terms of, of subsidizing entrepreneurship. So that basic income with you know because it, it it kind of gets rid of the kind of risk that that small bit, you know, that people who want to start small businesses or they have an idea that they want to, to go forward with. And, and a lot of people in the Green Party, I, I certainly know personally, are very into, into this aspect of it. Um, that it would give uh, people freedom to pursue things that they, that they feel, you know, could be commercially successful. Um, and, and the other thing is, I think, you know, the smartest people on the right realize that demand is collapsing in the economy. And without demand, there's really not much in the way of the economy. <laughs> so, um, you know, so that's that's sort of where where they sit. I mean, we can discuss that later as well. Um, just to say a few things about where I feel the movement's at. Um, 
obviously, I don't know, people have been following it over the last couple years or so, but there's been a kind of explosion of media about basic income, largely because of the, of the pilot studies that are being discussed in both Finland and, and the Netherlands, and actually now France. France has made massive strides with their, with their central government. It's quite amazing, which I can talk about later. Um, but just, as, just so that people know, um, those pilots are not a given. They're, they're still under discussion, and the, pl the plans for them are being worked out, certainly in Finland. They're very close to it, and I think because it's had so much publicity, I think they, politically, I think it would be very difficult for them not to do the pilots, you know, now that they've put so much into it. So we're looking at probably 2017, probably towards the end of 2017, we'll have, we'll, the pilots will start in Finland, hopefully. It's, hopefully, you know, everything else being, being the same. Um, in the Netherlands, it's a little bit more of a fluid situation. There are about, there are over 20, not just Utrecht, but there are over 20 towns in um, in the Netherlands who are who are really wanting to, you know, wanting to do pilot studies. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that works out. I mean, they've got a little bit, the towns in, in the Netherlands have a bit more autonomy than, than local government in this country, for example. Like in this country, if you wanted to do pilots, in a in a town, you have to basically get an act of parliament passed in order to enable that. I mean, I'm, that's not impossible, but it you know, but there are sort of bigger obstacles to it. Uh, whereas there's been much more kind of uh, localization of, of of services and benefits in in uh, in the Netherlands, which makes it much more possible for them to do it. Um, one disadvantage of what's being discussed both in in Finland and also in in the Netherlands is that. They aren't actually trying basic income as a whole community, so it's it, it will basically they'll, they'll they'll be piloting it with people who are already claiming welfare in one, in one form or another. So you don't get you don't get the kind of equalization thing that that we're hoping you know that we're seeing. Say you know the, there were a bunch of pilots run in in, in India um, for about three five years, I think, um, ending last year, two years ago. Um, there's a wonderful book about it called um, uh, Basic Income and Trans Transformative Policy, which talks about these. And they tested not only you know villages with basic income, villages without basic income, but also they tested villages with basic income and um, Versus, you know, villages with basic income and a lot of contact with uh, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India and villages that didn't have so much contact with them. So, so they also basically tested basic income with with strong organization and without it. So, uh, you know, I think that's it's quite you know that that in itself is quite interesting and, and it's worth it's, it's worth going into. Um, certainly in India, um, it it really even though it was actually a very small basic. Income, was nothing that you could actually live on. It was, I can't remember the actual figure, but it was something like six rupees a week or something like that. It was really, really tiny. Um, but the but they saw huge effects in terms of uh, children's nutrition. That that girls actually got fed properly for the first time, and so their birth, their their weights, their their weights started to equalize with the boys. Um, it, socially, girls sort of started to come out much more. They were much more sociable and, and didn't sort of hide all the time and talk to each other much more. Um, people with disabilities were much more accepted into the family. They were sort of treated as, as proper human beings as opposed to just sort of being left in the back room, which is what had, happened, it had been happening before. Um, and yeah, I mean, those sorts of, of effects on social inequalities, I think, are actually almost as, well, they're more important than any, almost any other aspect of it. I mean, you know, in, certainly in terms of the pilot. So uh, I definitely look into it. There, there are a number of videos on, on YouTube about what happened with the, if you look up sort of basic income, Indian pilot studies, there will be several, there are several videos about, about those, about that work there. Um, there were also, uh, there was a pilot study in Canada in the 70s, something called MINCOM. Um, again, this was actually targeted at, again, people that were already on benefits. But what they found, or what was found out a few years ago, because basically they had the pilots for a few years, the, poli the, wind, the political wind changed, and the, the, the evidence from the, the, the actual boxes of evidence ended up in a basement in Ottawa for about 20 years, 25 years, until a woman named up 
Evelyn Forget took saw them, and uh, she actually did a more of a kind of um, epidemiological study. So she was looking at, at sort of the health outcomes mainly, and she found uh, she found more than an eight percent drop in, in hospital visits. Um, she found that there was much less crime, there was much less domestic violence, and also that um, particularly boys ended up staying in, in school much longer. So you know, you think the it was done in a, in a fairly rural town in Canada and in the 70s and, and particularly boys um, ended up going to work much earlier before they before they actually graduated from high school so uh, one of the one of the things from the study was that the boys actually stayed stayed in school longer and got you know in the end got better jobs so that was a, a good outcome um, in terms of work uh, Again, it, both in the U.S., there was a, a kind of negative income tax study in the U.S. in the 70s at the same time. Um, women, women tended to stay at home longer with, with small children, you know, sort of children before they went to, went to school. Um, and also, again, you have this effect of younger kids, younger, you know, say teenagers up to 20s, you know, again, stayed longer in education, so they weren't, you know, so they didn't sort of feel forced to go out to work straight away. Um, what else should I talk about? I have to talk about. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, the just the other feminist argument is the divorce rate. Yes, that's right. So the divorce rate went up slightly. Yeah, it went up slightly in the U.S., which uh, you know depends so on whether you think it went up. Or it collapsed. It went it went up. up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, basically, so women didn't feel they had to stay with men for whatever reason. You know, economic for, reasons. For economic yeah. reasons. Yeah. So. But I think, you know, again, that's very important that uh, basic income be paid to the individual. And it was very much a, I mean, it was very much a demand in the 70s of claiming, you know, particularly women, uh, uh, women claimant union members, uh, that benefits be paid, you know, the, the whole fight about, about child benefit, for example, in the 70s was all about, you know, that it needed to be paid, there needed to be an individual payment. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's with the pilot studies that are being discussed in, I think in, in Finland they're going to be paying the individual, in the Netherlands it's not so sure, just simply because we don't know so much about what's going to happen with those pilot studies. But it could very, oh hi. Hi. Um, it's very much up, you know, again, the design of, of what's going to happen in the Netherlands is, is a little bit more, we just don't know quite yet what's going to happen. But there has been, you know, there has been some discussion about them, about them sort of being paid, about a so-called basic income being paid by household, which I think would be a bit of a disaster, actually. So hopefully that will you know, see their way through to doing it by, by the individual. <coughs> um, just also, I mean, if you're talking about, if, if you ever have to talk about basic income on the doorstep, just to say that I, what I found probably the most, the, the best approach is to talk about it historically, to start out historically, that Thomas Paine was one of the first people to talk about an unconditional payment which should be paid um, in, re in respect to the fact that people were being deprived at the time of, of, of the land. So the, it was a reaction to the enclosures and people losing their, their right to, to subsistence on, on common land. Um, and that kind of gets people sort of thinking about it in, that, in those terms. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is I know that there are a lot of people who are very into basic income at the moment because of the kind of jobs apocalypse that's supposed to happen with technology and stuff. And actually, um, when I'm talking about it with people, uh, I mean, generally what I'm finding is actually people are working much too hard, uh, whether, it's <coughs> whether it's two or three jobs to subsist or whether that's uh, one job, which is 60 hours a week, which or they're always on call with email or text or WhatsApp these days or whatever. You know, people are constantly, you know, feeling like they're kind of tied to the job, even if they're not actually on the job. And um, and that and but what also people are feeling is is you know, on the one hand, you have a lot of people that are working too hard, and on the other hand, you have people that are just have absolutely no access to a wage. So, and often you have that in the same family. So you have, you know, some people that are working 60 hours a week and you have other people that can't, can't even get five. So that kind of imbalance of jobs and also the fact that people are, um, <coughs> that education is not actually getting the kinds of jobs that, that people dreamt of. I mean, you know, we've got 
hugely qualified baristas in this country now that, you know. <laughs> and, you know, then it means 